Uh, I'm Bruce Hederick. I'm the Vice President uh, for Outreach at uh, JSTOR and Portico. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the um, pilot program that we started several years ago to begin providing alumni access. Uh, uh, Susan Gibbons from Yale will follow me. Uh, Damon Jagers after her from Columbia. And uh, Molly Tamarkin from uh, Duke. And they're kind of going to give you a perspective of what they're doing with alumni access at their institutions. Uh, so this is really broadly about extending access to the resources that you're licensing uh, to alumni and, and how that might be working. Um, we kind of got into this, I have to say, um, from the pilot program standpoint, uh, really from a mission perspective, we were seeing so many turnaways from people coming to us through Google that we knew probably were somehow affiliated with institutions who were licensing these resources. And it sort of set off a, uh, an array of, of programs that we began to think about. But one of them was uh, some of these people are probably alumni. Some of them are probably have left the institution and don't have access to these resources and what they're doing um, post-graduation. And is there a way that we could extend that access? And would libraries be interested in doing that? Is that something they would like to do e either from a development standpoint or from uh, lots of internal reasons that, that libraries might have at their own institution? Um, and we started to get uh, a number of requests from institutions saying this is something they're hearing from their alumni they'd like to do. Is, there, is this a program we offered? And uh, as typically what we do in those situations is we, we say, well, I'm not quite sure what the value of that would be. Certainly don't know what it would cost. Have no idea what the publishers who participate in JSTOR would actually think about that. Um, so let's kind of put a program together and see what we can learn. And that's precisely what we did for a couple of years. Um, and it was interesting. Uh, there were, I will say at the beginning, there were a lot of institutions who were very interested in participating in the pilot who fell away because they we're struggling with the technology of how one of the requirements we had is that they be able to segregate the access of their alumni from the main institution so that we could actually measure it as part of the pilot. Um, and that was really important and that was difficult for, for a number of institutions to figure out. Uh, a number of other institutions thought that their alumni association or the development office was gonna be very interested in doing this and after they went to talk to them, not so much. So. Um, there were different things that happened. I'm sure you'll hear experiences here um, all over the place. But um, it was an interesting two and a half years, and what we actually started to see was that usage uh, really, in some institutions, started to get fairly significant. So um, I'm, I'm just going to say that uh, from our perspective, it was a very useful pilot. It taught us quite a bit, both on the technology side of what was going to be required uh, both in understanding our publisher relationships and what they were thinking about alumni. And I have to say, one of the real sticky points um, for the publisher side is actually how you define alumni. Um, and every institution defines it differently. Uh, so, you know, in the sort of, in some sense, the narrowest terms is people who have graduated from your institution. And the, the way that we've sort of looked at it is people who attended the institution. But there are lots of institutions out there who would define alumni by just who gives money to the institution. <laughs> and, uh, and that causes some problems uh, in the publisher's eyes uh, when they start to think about this. So, um, so that, that's, that's certainly one thing to be thought about. Um, so our participation in this uh, program kind of grew over a couple of years. It's, 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 it ended at about 54 institutions, but you can see what the breakdown is. We, we tried to get people from um, not just in the United States. Uh, and actually, the UK was interesting because uh, King's College London, one of the better research institutions in the UK, um, when they announced their, now you don't think about UK institutions having like big alumni programs. Uh, they, they typically don't. Uh, uh, they're not driven by sports and things of that nature. And so uh, when they announced King's College announced in their alumni newsletter that they were going to be providing uh, JSTOR access. That first day, they the alumni office received 700 phone calls. Uh, I thought the guy was kidding, um, but but he was he he really said it. It became a fundraising activity for them, and uh, uh, that I thought that was interesting. Uh, I'll just give you some highlights of the usage. Um, 
we, you, uh, I tried to show each year kind of how things progressed. Uh, we started out small and, uh, you know, pretty much Columbia has been the people using uh, the resource the most. Uh, uh, Yale overtook them this year uh, in their, <laughs> their usage. But what I was really looking at was what percentage of the overall institutional usage was this accounting for? And, uh, and when you look across the 54 institutions, it was about 3% and growing, like 3% with a bullet. It was, uh, it was growing fairly substantially. And, you know, it ranged from institutions who had almost no alumni access use, uh, probably folks who hadn't gone out and really promoted it, versus Smith College this year, where 30% of their overall usage was driven by alumni. Um, so, it, there's this broad range right now of, of what's driving usage, and we're looking deeper into these numbers. Is that one alumnus that's at an institution in Turkey that doesn't have access and is getting everything they can? What is driving all that? But it's, it's not insignificant. And we had a couple of uh, theological seminaries that were in this pilot as well, and, and, and consistently uh, their usage from alumni was over 25% of their total institutional usage. So it kind of depends on the institution, depends on obviously how broad your alumni base is. Uh, but uh, where, we, where we settled here was to, to move it from the pilot to the program that was just announced at the beginning of November. And we're going to be making this available, this program, to all higher education institutions worldwide. Um, we're not pulling, moving this out into, um, we have a lot of, we have like 1,200 secondary schools. It's not moving out to high schools and things like that at this nature. We're, we're sticking with, with the higher education community. And we're going to see what happens. And uh, we're going to see how usage begins to move over time and at what types of institutions. And we may come up with a more robust, uh, you know, fee, fee scheme at some point in time. But right now we're just trying to keep it simple. And it's really simple institutions pay an additional 10% of whatever they pay JSTOR on an annual basis. And their alumni gets access to all of the collections that that institution happens to license. So that's kind of where uh, we've, we ended the pilot. We're in full program mode now. So I am going now to turn it over to Susan to talk about her experience at Yale, which I think is here. Okay, so let me start with a, a full disclosure. Um, I am on the, a new member of the board of Ithaca, which is the umbrella um, organization for JSTOR, but our decision to join the JSTOR alumni um, package happened before I arrived at Yale, and the implementation of it happened before I joined the board. So, so I just want full disclosure out there, not getting in any trouble here. Um, so our, our alumni agreement was signed in May of 2011. Um, the cost of it was 10% in addition to our annual fee for JSTOR. But at the time we signed it, we didn't have a mechanism for alumni authentication in place. We don't have the, um, the ability to um, identify just our alums within our NetID system, and therefore our alums just are not part of our NetID system. So we had signed a contract but didn't have a mechanism to start the program. But fortunately, we were able to work with the Association of um, Yale Alumni, which is called AYA. Histor well, AYA is actually independent of Yale. Um, that makes for interesting politics. But back in the 70s, um, the alums were not very happy with the leadership of Yale University, and they broke away and started their own organization. And so we have this quasi-relationship with AYA. Um, but what AYA has been doing all these years is registering um, alumni of Yale so that those alumni can then take full advantage of the networking opportunities that Yale offers throughout the country and throughout the world. So the partnership with AYA became our solution because they had already started building a database of alumni and giving them um, net, uh, a, a sort of um, ID and password system um, so that they could log into the AYA website and get access to different resources. So that became our solution. We couldn't figure it out through university IT, but we could find a solution for AYA. And this has been a win-win for them because once we announced that JSTOR access was available, all you needed to do was register with AYA, their numbers jumped um, precipitously. 
So it's not very attractive, but this is where you go to get your, your JSTOR access. You get your user ID and password um, from AYA. And we got this figured out in November of, two, I'm sorry, October of 2011. Um, the stats were very interesting for us. So we started in October 2011, and between October and the end of the year, we had 77,000 downloads just from our alums. So 5% of our total year's worth of JSTOR use was for our alumni. Um, and I put in some comparisons with, with Duke and Columbia here. Um, and then if you see this year, we're up to 12% of our overall use of JSTOR is for our alumni. Now, our alums are nerdy geeks, um, but they're no more nerdier geeks than, than, than my, my colleagues here. So I don't think it is it's sort of qualitatively about our alumni. Rather, I think my hypothesis is that it has a lot to do with how we pushed um, this, uh, this piece out, how we pushed out the news about JSTOR. So that's what I'm going to focus on, what that marketing looked like and the results of that. Um, so we started with a, a news article that went on to the Yale News site, um, and that was picked up pretty quickly. Um, and then our Yale Daily News, which is our student newspaper that comes out every day, they picked up the story. And both of these are, are news outlets that our alums read very regularly. Um, reading the Yale Daily is just sort of part of your morning routine uh, for any alum of, of Yale. Uh, it also went into the Yale Alumni Magazine, um, and so these were our basic ways of pushing this information out, in addition to Facebook and Twitter. And immediately it went viral. So the kinds of comments that came from Facebook, totally psyched, geeked, this make, but does that make me a geek? Uh, I think we're all so excited, the nerd in me can't help it, this makes me so happy. The Twitter comments, this is the best thing Yale has done for me since becoming an alum. Um, huge, seriously huge, Yale's just changed my life again. It went viral very, very quickly. Within 24 hours, all of this news went out, and it was largely the Facebook and the Twitter. So they picked up the news story and then just started spreading it across. Um, my library fantasies come true. Um, so our Office of Communication contacted us and said, what is going on? Because within 24 hours, this news story has 3,836 page views, um, which is huge. So it's 11% of the traffic to Yale News was for this story. And it had been shared on Facebook within 24 hours, 1,526 times. Um, so in both cases, this had really w had never happened for communication. And this was wonderful because Yale's Office of Communication suddenly looked at the library a little bit differently. They're like, wait a minute, you have news stories. And they have, we have since formed a really interesting partnership where almost every single week there is now a news story being pushed out about the library. They just hadn't thought of us as, a, as an organization or a part of campus that really had news to be pushed out. And now they're a great, great partner. So this alone was a terrific win for us because it changed our relationship. Um, so the story then got picked up even further. So the communication office saw the traffic, decided to push it out um, to um, more uh, national networks, and Inside Higher Ed picked up the story, um, and Times Higher Education did. Now, in all of this, it's quite strange because we were probably one of the last to join the pilot. We were at least number 12 or 13. So I don't know what it was at that point in time that just made this the right story at the right time. But something about it just got some national and then international attention. So then Time Higher Education, which is in London, contacted us and said, could you do an editorial about this? And the university said, sure, Susan will do it. <laughs> So I had a weekend where I had to write an editorial piece, and it really forced me to sit down and say, well, how do I put this in context? What is the reason we have done this? Um, and how does it fit the mission of the university? And what I chose to focus on was this idea of lifelong learning, that the skills that we, we say we're giving our students are not just research inquiry skills and, and, this, and, the, and this like, but also that we are making a commitment of lifelong learning for our alums. But how do we execute that? How do we actually provide anything for that? We do provide borrowing privileges, but you've really got to be in New Haven to take full advantage of that. So what is it we're doing? And I put this 
um, alumni access in the, that context of that relationship that should be lifelong of the university to the alums, not just for the money, but also th that we're offering um, services as well, and we're offering opportunities for them to continue in their intellectual inquiry throughout their lives. So um, then it also went viral across our alumni listservs, page books, blogs, Twitters, and everything else. So that's really what I think pushed those numbers very, very quickly. Um, and, it, and while it has that initial 77,000 hits in three months, this year we're about 100 and 150,000. Um, so it's actually leveled off a bit. So I think we, we, we satisfied a lot of interest right up front, and now it's sort of uh, leveling off, but still at a very, very high rate. Um, so the next steps for us are exploring other alumni packages. This was really the first package that we had even considered, and it was largely because we didn't know what that mechanism was. What was that authentication mechanism? So we're considering uh, EBSCO. One source is another one that our a uh, school of management has been providing their alumni. We're trying to see if we can bring it into the library and do it as an alumni-wide program. Um, the other thing we want to do is much, much stronger branding on the package itself. So right now, you sort of get the sense that this is brought to you by the library and AYA. AYA is provided us the portal, but it's being paid for by the library. And so we would like a much stronger branding that this has been brought to you by the library because our alums are individuals that we do our, most of our fundraising with. The other relationship change was with um, our Office of Development or Advancement or Fundraising, whatever you call that, that group on your campus. Um, this is the second institution I've worked with where they presume that the library doesn't have a lot of fundraising opportunities because we don't, quote, have many um, constituents. We don't have any graduates. We don't have any of anyone who majored in our, in our library, you know, that program. So without having that natural constituency, um, fundraisers often discount the library as a, an organization on campus that can offer a lot to fundraising. And this whole experience has changed that and actually flipped it around completely. And it is now, the library's becoming um, the hammer and everything that our alums are considering for, for doning is, is our nails out there. So um, I get regular now phone calls saying, we have someone who's interested. Is there something in the library that might get them interested? Um, and they really put out this um, program, the JSTOR Alumni Access, as being um, an opportunity as an example of what Yale is doing for its alums. It's not about the library, it's what Yale is doing for its alums and is putting it forward. We were in a situation where almost on a weekly basis we would get a phone call saying, can alums get access to online resources? And we were saying, no, sorry, can't, licenses, and we would explain why. Now we're able to say, not everything, but here's a really interesting package. Here's a really large, comprehensive group of um, quality journals that you now have access to. And it's wonderful to be able to not just say no week after week after week, which is what we were doing. So it's raised the profile of the library as a development partner and has changed that relationship in, in a really um, powerful way. Um, and another piece that we're doing as a result of this, we are um, now including alumni in what we call a scan and deliver project. Um, and this is based on the Harvard model, where if an alum has purchased borrowing privileges, and that's about $140, I think, for a year's worth of borrowing privileges, you get a borrower's card and you can borrow material. But now you can also participate in our scan and deliver program. And what that is, is anything in our collection, our general collection for which we physically own, so not electronically accessible, but actual ownership, not subscription, um, we will scan and deliver electronically to our students and faculty, but also our borrowing privilege alums. Um, and that would be within fair use. They're using it for, for purposes of research. They promise not to redistribute, but what that will mean a, a scan of a chapter of a book or an article, but we have to physically own the object, um, not through electronic. And that, we haven't yet marketed that heavily to our alums, because we're still trying to figure out what's gonna happen at a campus level. 
and already interest in that program will probably drive about 30,000 scans in one year. So we have to make sure we can handle that level before we really push out to our alumni. Um, but we think there's a lot of interest there as well. And it will start, I think, to approach what, what, what Cliff had mentioned yesterday with this world of MOOCs and open um, educational opportunities, our alums, if they participate in it, are going to need access to content, to the literature, to the material. And I don't see the MOOCs easily being able to bring that content in. So I think increasingly our alums are going to turn back to us and say, I want to take advantage of Coursera, but I need these three or four articles. Is the library able to help me in some way? And this might be another way that we're able to participate and really build that stronger relationship with our alums. So we have now negotiated with the university that we can do a library-specific um, alumni fund push. And we think that these kinds of programs are going to lead to what I think will be a very successful um, fundraising campaign this spring with our alums specifically for the library. So we think the costs that we're investing are going to, we're, we have already made them back. Um, and we think we will many times over as a result of this. So I will leave it to my, uh, my other colleagues up here and then we'll take questions at the end. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Damon Jaggers from Columbia. Uh, uh, I would like to start by saying that uh, I, I'm confident in the relative geekiness of, <laughs> of the alumni at Columbia. Uh, uh, but I, I took a little bit of a, of a broader approach. Uh, uh, Susan and I were joking that she went uh, narrow and deep, and I went broad and shallow. And that may be something <laughs> about our personalities. I'm not sure. But. Uh, uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of a broad overview of the fullness of our, of, of our alumni and friends uh, kind of outreach program. And it starts with, obviously, e-resources that we, that, that we, that we uh, license for them. But it, we also include a number of other uh, uh, resources, including the breadth of our locally digitized collections. Um, we push our institutional repository content towards them to, uh, to relative su amounts of success. And we also offer the full range of our, of our uh, reference services, our online and virtual reference services, which includes you know, email, phone, text, and all, all, all the normal uh, uh, culprits in that area. Um, we do offer all of these services free of charge, uh, uh, and uh, that also includes uh, on-site access to all of our libraries for all of our alumni. We do charge for borrowing privileges for alumni uh, if they choose to, uh, to want to partake of those. So we have a broad range of, uh, of basically data place platforms that we're using right now. Some of them, you may laugh, because we actually publish two of those that are up there, uh, both Chow and the Avery Index. But we, we, we do have a number of, uh, of different relationships with JSTOR, with Factiva, with ProQuest, and a number of different uh, uh, platforms that we use, about 10. Um, we, these were chosen initially, really, uh, by our services staff as those things that they thought alumni would find most useful, what our graduates would find. So we're, you know, we're, we're focusing on a lot of business-oriented databases, health, health uh, information, um, as well as newspapers and, uh, and general inter interest academic uh, uh, content. Um, we have received a number of, of uh, requests from many of our alumni, especially from our business school graduates, about uh, wanting really deeper disciplinary resources, especially around market research and data. And, 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 and as you would probably think, that's not something we're probably going to be easily be able to provide for them, being that uh, if those publishers were even interested in, uh, in wanting to provide that to our alumni, um, they would probably be at a, at a price point that, we, that wouldn't make sense for us. Um, they're more interested being in New York and in, in, uh, in selling that content back to the corporations that these folks work, work in. Um, how do we fund this? We are really funding this through a combination of our, uh, uh, our annual giving program our, uh, within the libraries and our collections budget. So we actually are putting some collections budget money towards this. Um, and we do, we do see this potentially expanding past this. Um, we are doing 
many, many of our, uh, of, uh, we're creating many of this, a lot of this access through just extensions of our current affiliate licensing. And, uh, and so we are, we are looking at opportunities rather through requests we see from our alum, our, alum, our alumni base, or through uh, opportunities as we discuss with publishers of where we might extend our current licenses and uh, uh, in a way that isn't too cost prohibitive that will allow us to, to uh, uh, move forward with, with broader access. Right now we're in conversations with Alexander Street Press to potentially add some media rich content uh, uh, for our alums. We've heard um, through an alumni survey that that might be of interest to them. So we're looking, we're looking at that right now. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, uh, how we kind of judge traffic, both of, you know, how we take a look at usage um, across these different platforms. And, uh, and we do it in a very simple way. We, we, we force our alums through, uh, 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 through our, UR, our URL resolver to get at most of this, uh, through, our, through that alumni and friends website. And so we're able to take a look at those hits of the sessions, of the request for a session that they're able to do for each of the, for, for each of the uh, 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 platforms that they're, they're looking to use. As you can see, JSTOR is by a, wide, a pretty wide margin the most uh, highly used uh, uh, resource that we're offering, followed by Factiva and ProQuest. And I should mention ProQuest, that's multiple databases within that platform uh, there. So you can see that, that, that uh, JSTOR is certainly uh, uh, really highly used and really valued by our alumni. The, uh, if we look at JSTOR usage itself, some of this data, I'll run through this pretty quickly because some of this data has already been discussed. Um, the red at the top is our, uh, our overall usage uh, of, of JSTOR, which is pretty robust. Um, it peaking in 2010 at just 0.2.8 million, uh, we call these significant accesses, the, the, the JSTOR metric of use. And, uh, and then we see the blue at the bottom. Uh, starting in 2009, we saw just under 91,000, excuse me, 92,000 uh, usage by, alum, by, our, by our alums. Um, and then we're looking at, uh, in 2010, a, proj a projection of about 162,000 usages. You'll notice that our overall usage of JSTOR uh, appears to have peaked in 2010 and is, is slowly, uh, is on a downward trend, but still very robust uh, usage. I think that, that, that Bruce would agree with that. But what we see, if we move forward, is that uh, uh, we see a real increase in relative terms of our alumni use versus the total use that we see. In 2010, we were just over 3.5% uh, of, of, of our alumni was our, of, of our total usage. And as we move towards uh, uh, the end of this year, we're looking at that as a percentage up above 8% of our total usage. Um, we, we, we prided ourselves on being the, uh, the, the biggest use in this pilot, but uh, now Yale has come in with all their, all their marketing and knocked us off. Um, but uh, but, but we, we feel as if we're getting re really a, a really nice usage in, in, uh, of JSTOR in our product. So um, I thought I would uh, end really with talking about a little bit of our motivations for doing this. Our motivations aren't unlike others. Uh, uh, we are really interested at base to be supporting our alumni uh, after they leave the real information rich environment that we're offering them on our campus and, and we all on all of our campuses. Um, we, we hear from them that uh, that's something that they would like to continue and so we, we find that it's important for us to try to, uh, to uh, 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 you know, kind of continue that. Now obviously behind that is the interest in building relationships with these folks. Uh, with, with our alumni in exactly the same way that Susan has talked about. Um, we hear the same thing from our development group uh, in that, uh, you know, you don't have, uh, we, we, you know, we, you don't create credit hours and you don't create graduates. So we find it's very important for us to be proactive in trying to build those relationships over time with the ultimate goal of, uh, of in, uh, you know, of increasing the base of potential donors and, and uh, increasing our ability to raise funds over time. Um, so our, motiv our motivations are fairly obvious. The, uh, how we've promoted this, um, this is actually a screenshot of an ad that we've run in the alumni magazine on multiple times. So we're working with our, our Office of Alumni Affairs in those ways, uh, this ad being one of them. But the most important uh, uh, real, uh, the method that has been most effective for us to uh, uh, 
is not something that we've done. It's really been what our, office, our Office of Alumni Affairs has done. They have picked, taken this up as a way that they can show value to, to uh, their members, and they have uh, been very active in pushing this through email blasts and through social media, uh, much, li much like we heard from Yale. Uh, uh, routinely, it's in their it's in their normal routine of 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 showing that this is a service that's being offered. So we're working. Uh, so we see that as probably our most effective method of promotion is through the Office of Alumni Affairs itself. And as you can see, we actually uh, uh, paid for the ad uh, 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 with our Office of Alumni Affairs down at the bottom. Um, so. So Bruce asked us when we were preparing for, for this a little bit to talk about if we see, you know, we, we, we've made this investment and we've made some of this investment out of our, out of our uh, actual collections budget, is there any return on that? And, and while we at Columbia don't have any direct metrics connecting uh, usage of these, uh, uh, of these databases by our alumni with increased giving, we are starting to actually see um, a, a loose connection. And what I mean by that is that we are starting to now to capture the, uh, the email addresses through, through the authentication scheme of the individuals who are using these databases. Now, to be clear, we are not tracking the content they're using. We're tracking the fact of their use. We're then taking those uh, emails and we're targeting those individuals in our annual giving campaign. And in a discussion last week with uh, our Michael Ryan, who, who, uh, who heads up a lot of our development efforts for alumni, uh, uh, he was able to tell me that since we've done that in the last year, um, we have actually, through that and a couple of other efforts, doubled the number of alumni who have given in our annual campaign. Now, I want to be clear, we haven't doubled the amount of money <laughs> given in our annual campaign, but it has, it has moved, you know, moved us down the line in actually increasing uh, very substantially the number of, uh, of individuals who are giving and any of you who work in these uh, you know work in development know that it's that's very important into building that broader base of givers as we look down the line in the next decades as these folks are coming so we definitely see that we, we, we feel that we are getting um, some type of return on, on the investment we're making in this um, I, I use the, R, the ORI term any of you know, know who I work for Jim Neal I shouldn't have done that and so this is being broadcast and it's going to be all over for me when I get back um, so I think I will, I'll, I'll end there, uh, uh, I have my questions uh, slide, um, I'll end there because we're going to have questions later, but I, I did want to make one last comment on, the, on, the, on some of the technical issues, um, because we have seen some of those technical issues, especially around authentication, at, not just with the JSTOR experience, but with, with, with some of the other uh, 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 databases that we've licensed, and it's really around the idea of the fact that we're, we're attempting to license or create extensions of the current, of some of our current licenses, and when we've done that, sometimes the license that we write for, for uh, alumni maps one-to-one -one in content or other access provisions, and in that case, we can use our current authentication scheme, and that's not an issue. But oftentimes, those mappings aren't one-to-one, -one. and so what we've ended up having to have is basically cobble, cobbling together on a resource by resource basis um, methods to make sure that we can have uh, 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 agreements and authentication to, to some of our vendors for two very different products using different schemes. And so for JSTOR, um, if I remember correctly, JSTOR, you, you, you actually provide a CGI script for us to run and, uh, and, but for something like the ProQuest databases, we, act, we did that ourselves. And, and while all of that work isn't overly arduous, and I'm sure all of you have, have the resources to be able to do that, it does add a little layer of complexity that you should be aware that you're gonna have to deal with if you were to, to move down some of these paths. And I think with that, I will, uh, I will move to the next person. Uh, good morning, I'm Molly Tamarkin. I'm the Associate University Librarian uh, for Information Technology at Duke. And um, it's funny going last, because you know, IT is often in the basement of things, and you know, we're like the last thought that people have. And, and I wasn't really thinking about the perspectives each of us would offer on this panel, but I realize now that you know, my presentation is very IT-centric. And I think that will be helpful, actually, if you're interested in um, deploying something like this at your institution, um, because 
you'll see the questions that we had. Um, and I use the, um, the sort of, the, um, the, I can't remember the person who came up with the storming, norming, forming, and performing lens to look at activities, but I use that as our sort of metaphor for, for this project. And I think in these questions, you can see that with IT, we kind of heard about it from here, we heard about it from there, we heard about it from different places, and the questions I got from the IT staff were things like, what are, what are we doing? What is this? Who, who thought of this? Who's paying for this? And most importantly, actually, who owns this? And, um, and I think you have to consider that because this is a service you're providing. So if something goes wrong, who, who's answering the question? Who's the person looking out for, um, for maintenance and updates? And um, when an idea is coming from development, and we have a very strong and wonderful development department in the library, but IT gets, traditionally gets um, very cynical about development, doing work for development. And it's very important that we, that we stress the service aspect of this. Um, and by continuing those connections with electronic da databases, it also, um, it also reinforces the fact that most, much information is not really accessible through uh, search engines like Google. So forming, we decided Duke Libraries will pay and we're going to set up the portal, what we're calling a portal, it's really a, just a landing page, and we're going to partner with the alumni office. And I, I should also say that when Susan was talking, everything sounded like such a win, 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 that I thought at the end she'd say, and then Sweden called and I got the Nobel Prize, and <laughs> it was all perfect, what a surprise. And ours is not like that, our experience is not like this. So we, what could be harder? You know, it seems very, very straightforward to us. And then when we started to actually implement this, we said, oh, we'll call up the web developer at uh, the alumni office and talk about where they're going to go once they click through our landing page. And, and you know, we called and they're, they're, nobody picked up the phone. They didn't actually have a web developer. And it made it very, very hard for us to implement this. And then, um, you know, I heard from our head of acquisitions, we have some new products. Um, how do we update this page? Well, who's, who's in charge of updating that page? Um, Typically, in the library, departments have pages, and traditionally, um, this, this page is not within the development um, site in the library, and so we need to have a workload to update the page. And how do we assess and adjust? Well, that's coming soon. Um, so I guess the issue of ownership is, is important. And I want to talk about, um, about some of the facts that sort of have led to, I guess I just have to say, our kind of lack of use of this resource. Um, I, well, 3% were, I guess, typical, but we're behind our peers, so that's sad. Um, but first of all, here's our homepage, and as you can see, um, well, you can't, right? Where did the alumni go here? <laughs> there is a tiny little link by the reading blue devil down there, but it's pretty hard to, um, to find this. And, but if you do click on it, um, you get this. And you get a whole page about alumni services, but then you get this little um, explanation that um, says you have to register with the Duke Alumni Directory. And then you have to click on this, and then you have to go here, and here are the databases you can use. Now, I think as, in addition to the ownership question, you have to consider what how is your alumni community being managed? Because in uh, Susan's case, um, AYI, AYI is managed by the Yale alumni for the Yale alumni. So I would suspect the alumni have a lot of stake in that community and probably a lot of pride in what they've done. And at Duke, um, and I remember when this happened because I've been at Duke for a while, Duke chose probably 10 years ago, maybe longer, to uh, contract with Harris Connect to create an alumni community through their services. And at the time, you know, I was just, I was in the library, I was just doing managing IT at Duke, and I, I, I got nervous about that because it was a little bit like handing over all this alumni information to a third party that sure, you can get all the reports you want, you can contract to get your data back, and all of that, 
but I wondered um, at the time if we were going to regret that decision later. And it's true that now uh, the alumni office is considering how to um, capture it back inside the organization. But one thing that happens when, when you go through this is that it feels commercial. The Duke Alumni Directory feels like if I register with them, I'm going to get a call asking me for money. And, and so I think rightfully many people find this a barrier because they're going to um, a site that I think may not feel as, as um, much of a community as, as the Yale one. I think Duke alumni have a very, very strong community, but I think that community is often expressed in ways outside of this service through you know, various uh, alumni associations and groups and, and all sorts of activities, Facebook, et cetera. So if you have a third party managing your alumni environment, um, that you have to think about um, what that community might, might, the message you're giving about that community. The, the other piece is that it did make authentication, I guess, a little bit more straightforward because we just directed them there and they're authenticating to that resource. But um, again, it would have been really nice if we'd had authentication in-house um, as, as within the Duke Identity Management System. And so finally, you see performing, or I say, well, kind of not really performing. We have about 3% of our total access is coming through that site. And um, we haven't done a lot of marketing. Um, we haven't done a lot of communication about it. We're still trying to figure out our process for this. And I guess I am relieved to hear that we're typical, uh, typical performance of other schools. But I think we could probably you know, do much better. I also think that one of, the, one of the other factors is that we do have such a strong development office in the library with strong alumni support. We have an annual fund. We have a very active library advisory board. And so this, this service did not feel to us like you know, a groundbreaker for us. It felt like something that would be nice to do, that would be helpful, but um, it, it didn't feel like it was going to change our world. Um, Obviously, we can do more with it, though. So that's the perspective from technology. So, Bruce, you're going to do questions? Well, uh, first, thank you to Molly and Susan and Damon for, for sharing this stuff with us. I think it's very interesting when you hear the different perspectives, and I'm sure uh, of all the people I see in this room, there's probably uh, more perspectives than, than even those. Um, I do think it's uh, I, I, a couple of things I'll, I'll pull out of what was discussed. I do think that Yale, Yale's alumni community is in, I'm not going to say is unique, but in some ways the way it operates is unique and it does drive a certain, um, it does drive a certain viral effect into things that maybe other, other institutions can't, don't necessarily benefit from all the time. Um, you know, the idea here was uh, uh, really, it wasn't about how much usage institutions were going to get. We wanted to look at that when we were thinking about, you know, what, do you, what a fees should be applied here. We need, we, you know, like most things that we do with JSTOR, it was what can we bear as an organization to make this sustainable as opposed to what would the market bear. And I, I don't know what the other resources charge for stuff like this, but we were trying to make a sort of a, a relationship between, that had usage as a part of the, of the denominator that we actually thought about. Um, but that was really hard, seeing the wide variance of things that we had and, and how do you go about that. I think that, I think what we're trying to understand now as we move into a more production side is, is what can we do to help the libraries get the word out? So um, we get a lot of usage, believe it or not, to JSTOR from Facebook and from Twitter. And, um, and can we do things in partnership with the institutions to help push the word out? Because a lot of times those people are uh, alumni of your particular institutions. Last year we had you know, over 100 million uh, turnaways, you know, people coming in from Google who we did not recognize as being authenticated. I'm sure many of them were associated with your institutions in one way or another. Is there a way that we could redirect them sometimes to to where, you know, to where they could have access to these things? So these are things that we're thinking about in a in a broader scheme. 
Uh, but this is just one, one uh, sort of peg of many that, that, that we've been working on to try to reach un what we call unaffiliated scholars in that way. They're very affiliated to you, but they're somewhat unaffiliated to us. And um, how, how do we go about doing that? Um, so I'll say that um, I'm, I'm happy for, to, ask, to answer any questions uh, for the panel. Um, and certainly feel free to stand up to the mic right here and um, tell us who you are, and then we'll answer your questions best we can. Jillian McCombs, Dean of Libraries at uh, Southern Methodist University. A question about two communities on campus that are related and how are you handling um, e-resources for them. Paying members, dues members of your friends of the libraries who are not always alums. And secondly, retired faculty. Because if you suddenly create this benefit for the alums and the, maybe the faculty don't have access or the friends who've been paying all along, how do you deal with that? Um, well, at Duke, we have, we have an open door policy in the library so that anyone in our community, in the Durham community, anyone who's physically able to, can come into the library and access electronic resources. They're not available to our paying, they're avail our, our people who have borrowing privileges in the library and you can purchase a card, um, have access when they're in the library, but they do not have off-site access. Um, retired faculty do have, as, as, as part of their role as, as an emeritus, have, um, have continued access. They have continued net ID privileges at Duke, which includes access to electronic resources. I think what's interesting in, for libraries is that um, what about retired librarians? What status mm -hmm. do they have? Are they faculty? Do they get that or are they considered staff? And that's been an issue because to, to maintain that access, you have to be sponsored as an affiliate in our identity system. And so for retired librarians, this is the only case actually where our library director sponsors them to get to continue that access. In general, in general, access to library resources is by virtue of your role in the community, not, not something that you give in and of itself. So that's yeah. the Duke story. And I'd say ours is quite similar. So emeriti faculty if they're given the status of emeriti, they have access, and we include them in our counts, our FTE counts. If they leave the institution to go to another institution, they, they did not earn that emeriti status and therefore um, are not in our counts for, for electronic access. Um, we are still working out what our friends program looks like. We've had historically many friends programs. The Beinecke had one, the medical library had another. We're trying to bring it all together um, so that what we will have um, will be the, the friends program, we cannot include in alumni access unless they happen to be alums. And we have a lot of friends who are not alums, but are, are scholars who use the Beinecke, for example, and, and, are, and have joined for those reasons. But what we are looking at is um, the borrowing privileges as being something that we give if you, if you uh, if through a friend you give at a certain level, and then that scan and deliver program as well as another one that we're looking at. So we're trying to understand where the boundaries are gonna be but you're right, it's going to be very confusing as to who's in which bucket, um, and keeping track of that is going to be uh, quite difficult, I think. Yeah, I, I think that I don't have a lot to add to this. Um, uh, we are, uh, our, our retired faculty are in a uh, classification that allows them to continue to get these resources uh, mm -hmm. online. Um, uh, uh, librarians on our campus, we have this officer system, so they fall within that as well. Um, uh, other types of staff are, are, are a different story. Um, the, uh, 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 we do have a situation in which we are offering services to alumni defined a little larger than people who are our graduates. And uh, uh, so we're, we're, and we're still working through those issues and we have to be very clear when we're looking at the agreements that we're staying on the right side of those agreements as we look through. But we, I wouldn't quite say that it's anybody who gives us money. That's not quite, <laughs> <laughs> not quite how we've, we've defined it, but we do have a little, a little bit, uh, we, we, we take a little bit broader view uh, about who we offer this access to. Thank you. Tom, Tom Leonard from Berkeley. Um, I can say ditto from a, Public, large public university to the criteria that we've heard from the three mm -hmm. privates. 
Um, my university has 450,000 living alumni <laughs> and 100,000 members of the Alumni Association. The criteria for joining that is that you write a small check that clears. Should those numbers um, <laughs> scare me in even thinking about a JSTOR relationship? Um, <laughs> I don't know if they should scare you, they should scare us. Um, I think that, I think what we've always tried to do with institutions is essentially have a trust relationship. How you've defined what you define, whether it's your institutional access or it's your alumni, is what we are working with you to, to trust with you on. We have, we, we did find from the pilot that it was important to our publishers to, to define what we meant by alumni and to make sure that definition was actually stated in the license agreement. Now, uh, it's important to us that, that institutions try to follow the spirit of that in that way. Um, but I'm not going to um, invoke my inner Bill Clinton here, but it, this isn't necessarily a don't ask, don't tell policy. But it's certainly one where we want to make sure the license agreement is clear on what is being said, and we, we want the institutions to, to follow the spirit of that. Now, that's JSTOR's perspective. Now, other ins now, others providing alumni access to being on their programs have different metrics and methodologies on how they actually charge for that, and th that may mean a lot more in that space. For Dewey, Penn State, I wanted to follow up on Tom's um, little check comment. Uh, there's this category of alumni who join the Alumni Association. Uh, I, I joined the Alumni Association at Penn State, but I've never taken a class or anything there. So that category is uh, proving a little bit complicated for us. And then there's other institutions uh, that don't have dues-paying alumni. And I've worked at at least one of those and that really kind of stopped us from thinking about it. So I wondered if any, anyone would like to comment on, the, on those two topics. Well, we aren't tying yeah. our access to this program to someone being connected to the Alumni Association. This is actually a relationship that is if they are an alum and they will be in a, in a database and authenticated as one. And that's the connection for us. We're working with the Alumni Association mm -hmm. um, on uh, you know, because we're trying to build that relationship as well, but it's not, a, for us, a, 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 that's not the the, uh, the trigger that allows someone mm -hmm. to have access. I don't know. And, and same at Yale. Um, the alum does not have to give money to register with the alumni, AYA, to say that they're alum. They register, they're authenticated as being an alum, and, and of course, Yale will follow you and find you and will call you regularly, and that's just <laughs> the Yale way of, of fundraising. And, and it's it's part of the culture, it's not a, a they, they know that that happens. Um, but it, they do not have to give a dollar to, to join AYA, they are, they are it, in it because they have graduated. I'm not, you know, if you're, I'm not sure what it means to be in the alumni directory for Duke, actually. I, I haven't looked at that, um, that pool, but, you know, probably mostly alumni and probably some people who have important roles with the university or an important history with the university that may not be alumni. I believe though that um, it is free to join that, that group and to register there. And so uh, certainly I wouldn't make a distinguish, a distinguish between dues paying members and not this is a service to people in that community. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just say one other thing. This is, this is new. It's new for a lot. I mean, uh, some of the uh, providers you all have, are getting alumni access from may have been providing stuff for, for several years. Uh, but it is new and, and I think we're gonna see these questions actually come, come to the forefront as usage starts to uh, grow uh, from, if we see usage grow from alumni to something that is substantial. Uh, I know the publishers that participate in JSTOR are interested in getting that content out to, to people. That's, that's really what their mission is. Uh, and if we can if we can help provide them some additional revenue uh, by doing that, then I think they think okay, all seems right with the world. Um, and so that's why we're taking a liberal uh, interpretation of that. Um, but I think as time moves on, it'll just we'll just have to see. And different publishers, different vendors will act in different ways depending on what 
level of usage they see happening from these places. Cecilia. Cecilia, unaffiliated. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, I'd like to say thank you. <laughs> it will make my life a little easier if I can figure out if my university actually understands that I exist, except for fun drives. Um, <laughs> But I just wanted to say thanks, may keep up the good work. Some of us actually are unaffiliated researchers. Yes, Tom, I have a spousal unit card to Berkeley, but, <laughs> but that doesn't get me a whole lot of electronic access. Um, so anyway, that's all. I just want to say thanks, keep up the good work, fight the fight, get me authenticated, let me get to the day that I need to do my work. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, our time's about over. Uh, I do appreciate everybody spending time with us, and thank you to our speakers for doing a wonderful job. I appreciate that. And uh, enjoy lunch. Thank you.